Be present, Mr. Martin L. Thank you. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, well, I'm going to talk about the history of wireless as it relates to 2LO. Uh, I'll give you a guided tour of the transmitter itself, and then I'll say a few words about BBC Transmission, uh, the organisation that started with 2LO. Now, this is the key technology that enabled the BBC to start broadcasting 80 years ago today. But it was 80, about 80 years before that uh, that Michael Faraday first started putting forward ideas that were related to radio waves. He inspired James Clerk Maxwell, who did brilliant mathematics, to actually, in essence, prove theoretically the existence of radio waves. And then in 1888, Heinrich Hertz actually demonstrated radio waves being transmitted and, and received. In the 1890s, a number of people, but notably Oliver Lodge and Guglielmo Marconi, took that original experimental transmission and reception, and, and reception and turned it into a viable wireless telegraphy system. Now, around that time, a teenager called Henry uh, Joseph Round became interested in the subject. And when he graduated from the Royal School of Science in London, he joined the Marconi Company in 1902. And it wasn't many years before he became one of Guglielmo Marconi's elite band of top engineers. He was the person who, about 20 years after he joined Marconi, designed this transmitter. Now, this was only one of his many achievements. And so I'm going to return to Henry, jo Henry Joseph Round uh, a few times uh, <coughs> later in my talk. Now, in the early days, radio waves were produced with spark transmitters. And uh, a spark transmitter would contain a coil forming an inductor, something like that, a capacitor, parallel plates of, of steel or some sort of metal, something like that. And together, those two components would establish the very high rate of oscillation that's needed in order to launch radio waves. There was then very high voltage applied and a spark to sort of kick it into oscillation. And the result was really a very high power radio wave that could be launched from an aerial. And it was necessary for it to be high power in those days because the receivers were not at all sensitive. Um, the big problem with spark transmitters is that although they produced an enormous radio wave, it died down very quickly. And this was absolutely hopeless when it came to broadcasting um, sound and, and music. And so something new was required, really. People did actually um, attempt to transmit speech with, with some of the later types of spark transmitters, but it was pretty hopeless. But what happened um, a few years later, in the early 1900s, is that a device called the Poulsen Arc was invented. And this is a device uh, which replaced the spark. It had this, this pulse and arc instead of the spark in the transmitter. And this produced something that was at least um, close to a continuous wave. And I want to explain that what's needed for sound and for, uh, for speech and for music um, is it, necessary to start with a continuous wave, not one of these ones that dies down from a spark transmitter. So you start with a continuous wave and then vary it in sympathy with the sound that's to be transmitted. So the pulse and arc was one way of producing the continuous wave. Another way, which I sort of regard as a bit of a brute force method, is to use an alternator, a high-frequency alternator. A gentleman called Alexanderson in the United States uh, developed such a, a generator, and they were widely used right up into the 1920s. Uh, they weighed anything up to 50 tons, though, and they were ex extremely expensive. But nevertheless, it was capable of generating a continuous wave. That's the first problem, getting the continuous wave. Next problem is actually modulating it, varying it in sympathy with the sound. Well, there's um, a man called Reginald Fessenden in the United States who addressed this particular problem by connecting a water-cooled microphone directly into the aerial circuit of the transmitter. <coughs> 
Uh, I think that this must have been one of the most dangerous experiments in the history of wireless. <laughs> it, he had, the person speaking into the microphone would have had thousands of volts right up close to the, to, to the face. And in addition to that, the microphone got extremely hot. But I'm pleased to report that safety was a consideration. They thought about this, and they covered the microphone with asbestos. <laughs> <laughs> Amazingly, this system did actually work. And by 1906, uh, they had actually demonstrated speech being transmitted over hundreds of miles using this system. But it wasn't really a viable system for the future. And, of course, the big breakthrough came with the development or the invention of the thermionic valve, one of these things, which I'm terrified of touching, <laughs> walking into. Um, it was Marconi's scientific advisor, Professor J.A. Fleming, who invented the, what we now call the diode valve in 1904. And his arch rival across the pond, uh, Dr. Lee de Forest, invented what we now call the triode valve a couple of years later in 1906. But in both cases, they were used, these diode, the diode and the triode valve were used in receivers. They were used as detectors in receivers. And it was another six years before it was realized that a triode valve could be used to amplify and to oscillate at radio frequencies. And it was realized more or less at the same time by about, um, well, at least half a dozen people. Um, I've, I've read of uh, four people in the United States, one in Germany, and in England by Mr. H.J. Round. And in fact, by 1913, um, Mr. Round had produced um, a, an all-valve transmitter and receiver. This, mind you, was just after he had returned from the upper reaches of the Amazon, where he had created what was probably the world's first wave-changeable high-power transmitter. Uh, it transmitted on low frequencies in the day and high frequencies at night to overcome propagation problems with the Amazon rainforest. Three years later, the German high seas fleet started to break out into the North Sea. This was discovered by a radio direction finding system that was set up in Britain. The Admiralty was alerted the British Grand Fleet set out to intercept it, and what followed was the biggest battle in naval history, the Battle of Jutland. The person who was responsible for inventing and uh, overseeing this radio direction finding system was Mr. J. H. H. J. Round. So he achieved quite a few things even in that short space of time. At the end of the war, valves had become relatively reliable devices uh, that were produced in large numbers. And really the scene was now set for broadcasting to develop. Most of the activity took place in the United States to begin with. And by the time that Dame Nellie Melba made her, first, her famous broadcast in uh, England, there were something like 250 licenses across America for experimental transmissions of one sort or another. And, by, uh, and it was in fact, I think it was November 1920, when a station in Pittsburgh uh, with the call sign KDKA claims to be the first radio station uh, to produce a commercial service with, with programs scheduled and, and advertised in advance. But by 1923, in the United States, there were some 500 radio stations, and they, they were, the interference was terrible because it hadn't, the frequencies hadn't been planned and coordinated as, as they should have been. So it was really quite a chaotic situation. Broadcasting started rather more cautiously in Britain. In 1919, the Marconi Company um, started developing a series of wireless telephony transmitters, not particularly designed for broadcasting, it's for wireless telephony, uh, but they were given a, a license under the call sign MZX to carry out test transmissions. Now, these test transmissions started off in a, in a fairly um, straightforward manner, but after, I think it was in January 1920, that the designers, uh, W.T. Ditcham and H.J. Round, 
they got fed up with the standard routine of just reading out railway timetables and the like for their test transmissions. So that was bound to happen, wasn't it? <laughs> the, um, they, so they got fed up with their test, tra test transmissions just being railway timetables and things like that that they read out. They started playing gramophone records. And somewhat to their surprise, uh, this was greatly appreciated by the growing band of uh, amateur radio listeners that, that were appearing um, around the UK and indeed elsewhere. So, encouraged by this, they started with live music as well. And they made use of the uh, musical talents of a number of staff within the Marconi works at Chelmsford. And so they went along with their violins and their trumpets and whatever and you know, did various recitals. Eventually, this led to the famous broadcast on the 15th of June 1920 by Dame Nellie Melba, the opera singer. Uh, she was actually paid um, a lot of money by the Daily Mail for this, uh, for this broadcast. Um, and everything went well to begin with, well, reasonably well. She had the carpet taken out. She didn't like the carpet when she walked into the studio. But broadly speaking, everything went well to, to start with. She went into her concert, and when she got into her third song, um, a, a valve in the transmitter, just like this one, failed. Now, H.J. Round um, decided to wait until she had finished her planned concert, concert um, because... Of course, she didn't know that it had failed. And then he went up to her and said, Madam Melba, the world is calling for more. <laughs> Meanwhile, his colleague... Because <laughs> he, he didn't really know what the world wanted. <laughs> but Meanwhile, his, his colleague, uh, Mr Ditcham, was furiously changing the valve. Um, and uh, fortunately, she took the bait. Uh, and she carried on singing for, for quite a while longer. Um, much to everyone's delight. Um, the, the audience... Um, was probably a few thousand. Um, someone in the audience might be able to correct me on this, but as far as I can make out, interpolating a bit from, from the information I've read, it, it would have been a few thousand people that, that, that could hear her. And um, it was greatly appreciated by, by everybody. Everybody, that is, except for the Postmaster General. He thought that this was a frivolous use of the radio waves. Well, um, I don't think it was actually because he thought it was a frivolous use of the radio waves, but he did actually withdraw the licence, MZX, from Marconi a few months later, in November. In fact, I think the main reason for it was a number of complaints and concerns about interference. So, in, in, to a large extent, the uh, broadcasting airwaves went quiet uh, at the end of 1920, in the UK, that is. Um, by this time, though, there was a, a broadcasting station in Holland uh, that had become quite popular, um, both in the UK and, and elsewhere. Uh, and they were particularly popular for the Sunday evening concerts that they put on. And these became known as the Hague Concerts. They were so popular um, that the Daily Mail actually paid for a year's worth of programmes from, from this uh, uh, transmitter in, in the Hague. But... It continued the, the momentum for people wanting to have broadcasting. And so throughout 1921, uh, 1921, this pressure increased and increased. And eventually the uh, post office relented and issued a license under the uh, call sign 2MT uh, for a broadcast. Mind you, they were not all that generous because this particular license allowed um, 15 minutes of speech and music uh, within a half-hour test transmission once a week. Oh, and by the way, they had to switch off for three minutes every so often just to, make, just to listen out for anyone complaining of interference. However, it was better than nothing. The, the actual transmitter used for 2MT was a bit of a lash-up compared with the original two, uh, MZX that, that Marconi uh, used at their Chelmsford works, and indeed very much a lash-up compared with this transmitter. Um, it was installed in the, the famous ex-army hut in Rittle, uh, just outside Chelmsford. Um, and broadcasts broadcast started in um, February 1922. Um, all started in a fairly straightforward manner. Um, they <coughs> played a gramophone record, announcement came on, that was, and now here is, etc. But after about six weeks... 
Uh, one of the key engineers involved in, in all of this, P.P. Um, uh, Eckersley, um, he hadn't been involved in the program side of it up to then, but he decided after six weeks of this to sit in on, a, on what amounted to a sort of program planning meeting, which was held at their local pub uh, with a nice meal. Um, and this meal evidently went on rather longer than usual. And when they all got back to the, to, to the hut at Rittle, ready to start the broadcast, P.P. Eckersley was in, shall we say, high spirits. And he actually took over the microphone. And the, the whole evening's broadcast was, was evidently hilarious. Um, he was you know, quite a talented performer. Um, the, uh, he, broke, he broke the rules. You know, he didn't switch the transmitter off for the three minutes, and he carried on broadcasting much longer than, than he ought to have done, etc. But nevertheless... Finished the broadcast that Tuesday evening. Following morning, they were all a bit worried about you know, what the reaction might be. But fortunately, they kept their license. Um, and fortunately, uh, the audience thought it was wonderful. You know, it was uh, thoroughly enjoyed by, it, by everybody. And actually, he carried on broadcasting uh, in this sort of vein for, for a, a long time, uh, best part of a year, every Tuesday evening. Now, everyone enjoyed it, except, in this instance, um, Mr. Arthur Burroughs, who was head of uh, publicity at the Marconi Company. He didn't like what uh, P.P. Eckersley was doing there. Um, but anyway, the broadcast continued. I think it must have been despite Peter Eckersley's broadcast rather than because of them, but within a few months, the Marconi Company had been given an extra license, this time for 2LO. Now, when 2LO started, Arthur Burroughs, who was the head of publicity, used to be the head of publicity at, at Marconi, he, he was in charge of the programming for 2LO. Uh, and he adopted a policy right from the outset that nothing must be said that could possibly cause offence. As a consequence of this, the, the broadcasts from 2LO were very... Um, stayed and, and sort of rather boring compared with the, the off-the-cuff sort of remarks that were coming out of, of, from Peter Eckersley at 2MT. Um, and this, uh, people obviously listen to both broadcasts, um, but evidently Arthur Burroughs received letters from members of the public saying, would he mind switching off 2LO uh, on a Tuesday evening so that they could hear Peter Eckersley broadcasting at 2MT. Um, <laughs> the, the receivers weren't very selective in those days. Um, uh, I don't think he ever did switch it off, but, uh, but it's, uh, I've read that in a couple of places <laughs> that less, such letters were sent. Um, the situation, though, with 2MT, it, sorry, with 2LO, is that it started broadcasting at a time when the, when the pressure for further broadcasting throughout, throughout Britain was increasing a lot. Um, 2LO started on the 11th of May, 1922. On the one week later, on the 18th of May, uh, the post office called a meeting of all interested parties, um, or including about a couple of dozen applicants uh, for broadcast licences. And they were particularly keen to avoid the chaotic situation that was emerging in, in, the, U, in the US. Uh, so they called this, this uh, meeting... And as a result of that, a committee was formed that was chaired by the uh, president of the Institution of Electrical Engineers. They carried out their work and had another important meeting in October 1922. And it, it was at that meeting that the British Broadcasting Company was established. Uh, initially, it consisted of the six major wireless receiver manufacturers and uh, 200 other companies that, that had an interest in, in broadcasting. The income was from a half share in the 10 shilling licence fee and also about 10% royalty on each wireless set sold. Now, in the run-up to the BBC being formed uh, 80 years ago today, um, the original 2LO, 2, 2LO transmitter was actually replaced with the one that we see before us because the original 2LO transmitter pre-BBC that started on the 11th of May, 1922. That was a smaller transmitter compared with this, um, and it um, was lower power. The original license was just 100 watts, 
um, and this is, is just over a kilowatt. Um, so when the BBC was ab about to be formed, this transmitter was designed and, and produced. So this is the first transmitter that the British Broadcasting Company used for its transmission. So what I'll do now is uh, give you a little bit of a guided tour. The electricity for this uh, transmitter came from the Charing Cross power station, which was just down the road from Marconi House in the Strand, and that produced 500 volts uh, DC. It first went into a rotating machine that turned it into 500 volts AC at 500 hertz, then into a transformer that stepped it up to a higher voltage. And this panel here um, rectified that, uh, that higher voltage, so it's uh, these three valves, these smoothing components un uh, up there, and I'm not sure what's happened to the choke that ought to be down there, but, <laughs> um, the, but that's the panel um, that produced 10,000 volts DC to run the rest of the transmitter. This valve, together with these um, inductors and capacitors, these things are capacitors, or the old-fashioned ones, and, and down there, that formed an oscillator which established the actual broadcast frequency for the transmitter. In other words, the position on the tuning dial for the receiver. And it fed into uh, this valve over here, which amplified the radio frequency signal um, and feeding through other components here, um, inductors and capacitors in the main, uh, it fed about one and a half kilowatts, I've read 1.2 or 1.5 kilowatts of that order, um, out through that terminal there, which went to the aerial, the transmitter aerial. So this part of the transmitter uh, produced the continuous wave that I was talking about earlier. Next problem is to modulate it, to vary that continuous wave um, in sympathy with the sound signal to be transmitted. So the studio produced um, an audio signal which fed into this valve, which amplified it, and the output of that valve fed these four in parallel. And I didn't look carefully enough earlier on, and I was expecting to say, and together with that speech choke up there, um, does anyone know where the speech choke is? Is it available? No. Okay, there's a, there's a, there's a, a, a very heavy coil, of, of, uh, coil um, that's, that's associated with this. Um, th these, so this, this panel here, um, ha its job was to control the 10,000 volts that I mentioned earlier on, and it varied that 10,000 volts up and down as it was applied to that valve. And by varying that supply voltage to the valve, it had the effect of making the radio frequency wave that came out of the aerial get bigger and smaller as the sound um, varied, the input sound varied. So that basically is it. That's, that's, that's the uh, quick run through the, the transmitter itself. This actually formed, in effect, the prototype for Marconi's Q-type transmitters, as they called them. And the Q-types were... Um, used elsewhere on the BBC, and they were also sold abroad. Um, in quite a number of broadcasters overseas uh, used them. This particular transmitter stayed in, in service until March 1925, when it was um, taken over by a transmitter that was installed in the Selfridges building in Oxford Street, and that transmitter was, in fact, a double Q transmitter had 12 kilowatts input power, 2 kilowatts output power. A bit more powerful than this, it extended the service area somewhat. That transmitter still had the call sign 2LO, and it carried on until October 1929. Uh, at that point, uh, the service was taken over by a higher power transmitter um, in Brookmans Park, about 15 miles to the north, and that transmitter didn't have the, the, the call sign 2LO. So this, this is the, the, the first 2LO transmitter that the BBC used right from the beginning as, as, as a British Broadcasting Company. Um, I'd like, now like to take you forward about 25 years to 19, I think it's about 1954. And a senior BBC manager was visiting 
Brookman's Park transmitting station. And as he was walking around, um, he noticed um, a stack of rather interesting looking um, pieces of antiquated transmitter equipment, and he asked what they were. Um, and when he was told that they came from the BBC's original transmitter, 2LO, he realised their importance and decided then and there that the transmitter should be rebuilt. Uh, and, in fact, and as a result of that, two engineers at Brookman's Park were given the job of rebuilding it in the 1950s. Uh, it involved quite a lot of detective work and, and careful restoration, uh, but this is the result. The, uh, the transmitter was restored a, a little bit more. A little bit more work was done on it, done on it in the early 1970s, um, and the impetus for that was uh, it, it was going to be featured in a film on the history of wireless. Unfortunately, as far as I can tell, the shots of 2LO never actually reached the final film. However, um, it, you know, it, it appeared in a number of um, uh, exhibitions and so on o over that time. In the late 1970s, about 25 years after it had been rebuilt, another senior BBC manager came along to Brookman's Park and he took a look at it, asked what it was, and was told it was 2LO, BBC's original transmitter, um, and he said, oh, rubbish, throw it in a skit, get rid of it. Fortunately... Fortunately, the person who was in, in charge of all of the BBC transmitters in the southeast of England said, over my dead body. And actually, this, this was quite a brave thing to do, given the extremely robust management style of the senior man. Um, however, I'm pleased to say uh, the transmitter's still here. Um, it was used in 1992 uh, in, for the BBC's 70th uh, anniversary. It was on display in Broadcasting House. Um, and since then, it's been stored at uh, Daventry, uh, where it's been looked after and, and more recently prepared for um, transferring to the Science Museum. Now, I'm delighted to say that two of the people that I've referred to just now are with us tonight. Um, and in particular... Um, I'd like to um, uh, point out Charlie Sutton, who is sitting in the back row there. And Charlie is one of the engineers who rebuilt this glorious transmitter uh, in the 1950s. So. Um, I think we'll take that applause as, as also being for his colleague, Ray Milligan, who can't, uh, can't be here tonight. Is that right, Charlie? Yeah. yeah. The other person who's here tonight um, who, uh, is, is uh, Norman Shacklady, who's sitting just back there, who protected the transmitter from the scrap heap. <laughs> <laughs> Now, um, the, uh, in, in the case of Norman, Norman and I are co-editors of uh, a book called On Air. Uh, you've got these green cards that have been handed out to you already, so you know about it. But uh, Norman and I um, have been co-editing the book on um, the, telling the story of, of BBC transmission, which basically started with 2LO and went uh, right up to um, the point of privatisation in 1997. Um, the, the story um, involves quite a lot of people. We have had uh, about just over 50 people contributing to this story. I mean, most people know about the services that the, that the BBC has developed over all of these years. But this book tells the behind-the-scenes story about how all of these, these various services appeared. And, the, and obviously, you know, it's, it's quite well known about colour TV and stereo sound and all this sort of thing. Um, perhaps not quite so well known are all of the um, overseas broadcasts that take place. I mean, we've got big transmitters, or the BBC transmits from big transmitters uh, which run in, in a fully automatic way uh, in places like uh, the Thailand and the Seychelles and Caribbean and so on. And the, the book includes stories of all the things going on there. Norman and I will be obviously only too happy to uh, talk to you more about the, uh, the transmitters. I mean, Norman can tell you about how the BBC helped in the Falklands War and on Ascension and all sorts of interesting things like that. Um, but the, uh, the book isn't out yet, unfortunately. It'll probably be in, uh, um, available in January. 
and uh, there's a website pointed to on, on, on that card if, if you're interested. Uh, so, I think with that, I say thank you very much for listening to my commercial, <laughs> and thank you very much for listening to my talk.